Today on Blue 58, the Packers' search for a defensive coordinator appears to be heating up. Who's it going to be? And will Matt LaFleur get it right this time? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. I am happy to be with you here for another episode. The defensive coordinator search grinds on. It. I, I know, I know it's just part of how this... I guess news cycle sort of went, but it feels like this has taken forever. Last Wednesday, Joe Barry gets the axe, just six hours after we release a podcast speculating on his future. Um, and then the search begins. Details trickle out over the next couple of days about who the Packers are interested in interviewing. And then Saturday, we get the the drop from Andrew Mertig on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, that the Packers are interested in hiring uh, Christian Parker of the Denver Broncos, who we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, that's, I don't have any reason to, to doubt that report, but now it's Tuesday afternoon and nothing else has happened, and news of more Packers interviews has come out. So, are you getting a little antsy? Because I am. I'm just, it feels like it's been a really, really long time, but I know that a lot of it is just me sitting around on Saturday and Sunday just waiting for the news to drop and and knowing kind of in my heart that it's probably not going to come on a Saturday or a Sunday, but it just feels like it's been a really, really long time. We do know that the Packers have interviewed six guys. Just before I hit record on this episode, news broke that Bobby Babich, the linebacker coach uh, for the uh, Buffalo Bills, has been promoted to their defensive coordinator job. So he is out of the running now. So there's five other candidates that the Packers have interviewed. I think we would need to review those candidates. We did kind of a big rundown on on all the guys last time around. We need to review those candidates that they've talked to and kind of give an argument for both for or against here. I'm going to go with kind of my gut feeling as to how, you know, I initially react to these guys and then try to talk myself out of that position by trying to give a counterpoint uh, as to, you know, that, that argument, you know, what really should we be thinking here? So, uh, let's start with Brandon Staley, the f- first real reported candidate and one of the biggest names, probably the biggest name in the search so far. 41 years old. If NFL experience matters to you, he actually has less NFL experience than some of the other guys on this list. Denard Wilson, for instance, has been coaching in the NFL five years longer than Staley has, but Staley has more, quote unquote, high level experience. Among the guys on the list, I think you could fairly characterize him as the most diehard Fangio disciple that they've talked to so far before so far because he worked for the man himself for three years first as the outside linebackers coach for the Chicago Bears uh, in 2017 and 2018 then with the the Denver Broncos in 2019 during Fangio's short stint as the the Broncos head coach then he jumps over to the Rams, gets an opportunity to be their defensive coordinator. Then after one year with the Rams and they had the number one scoring defense in the league, he jumps to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. So a very quick rise for Brandon Staley, just five years between his first NFL gig and when he takes over as the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. My gut feeling on Staley, generally speaking, is a no if we're looking for a guy who's coordinated or been a part of good defenses before, there is some evidence to to his connection to some great defenses. But generally speaking, I think what we do have to go on with Staley is not great as a high-end coordinator. Because the Rams were good in 2020, but they had a bunch of elite talent. The Chargers had some good talent. They had, well, Derwin James is great. Uh, Joey Bosa, obviously very good, though less healthy than his brother. Uh, late career Khalil Mack in there for a little while. A uh, little while, other guys in there as well. But they weren't as good. Those players were not as good or as consistently as available as the the high end talent on the Rams. And so the Chargers' defense just wasn't as good. And I think reading around that seems to be one of the more consistent knocks against a quote unquote Fangio defense. You need elite players to run it. I don't know if that is a Fangio-specific criticism or just an observation about defense in general. We've said that for a long time on this show. It's harder to have an elite defense than an elite offense because you need more talent. But still, I don't think it's a point in the the trees' favor, put it that way. 
There's also the fact that his head coaching tenure was mired by some behind-the-scenes stuff with the Chargers. From an ESPN article in December, quote, Over Staley's tenure, tension mounted between uh, players who team sources described as Staley's guys and others who predated Staley or had fallen out of his favor. Staley alienated some players, according to team sources, for a few birthday announcements were a clear indication of where they stood. In a team meeting on November 16th, Staley projected birthday graphics for linebacker Kenneth Murray Jr., defensive tackle Jared Clark, and guard Jordan McFadden on a video screen, but only said happy birthday to Murray in the meeting, according to a team source who was present. After practice two days later, Staley said happy birthday to offensive guard Zion Johnson in front of the team. Multiple players mentioned that it was also rookie linebacker Dan Henley's birthday, to which Staley replied, and Dan too, in a dismissive way before quickly wrapping up practice, according to team sources. Guys didn't feel included. He made it feel like a team. He didn't make it feel like a team, one team source said of Staley. He made it feel like a fraternity house. Certain guys are in the frat, certain guys aren't, end quote. So, not great. Counterpoint to all that, though, being defensive coordinator is less about the people than the scheme. Teaching is important. You know, managing the players on your defense is important, but it's less important than it is as a head coach. And you have to wonder how much scheme stuff did um, did Staley get to do as the the head coach of the Chargers. Your attention is certainly divided in that instance. It wouldn't be, at least not to the same extent, as it was when he was a head coach if he was a defensive coordinator. There's also some counterfactuals in that very same ESPN article, quoting now from that same piece, quote, Quentin Johnston, the Chargers' 2023 first-round pick, had his lowest moment of the season in Week 11 against the Green Bay Packers. Johnston dropped a wide-open pass that would have put the Chargers in field goal range with 23 seconds left in the game. The Packers won 23-20, to 20, and the Chargers fell to 4-6. and six. Johnston was visibly upset in the locker room and said there was no excuse for the miscue. After the game, Staley let loose with a tirade aimed at reporters who questioned the coach's confidence in himself and his defense. Staley called Johnston into his office the next day and pulled up examples of the criticism he'd been receiving. Staley's message to Johnson was to block out the noise, as Staley planned to do, because the Chargers believed in him. That was honestly real big for me, Johnston told the ESPN, especially just being my first year and honestly having being my first time going through something like that in sports. I've always been real consistent. I have never really had just a super bad game like the ones I've been having. So for him to just come and say that as a head coach, that meant a lot to me, end quote. There are other examples like that out there of Staley hitting the right notes with with personnel and people. As to his coaching philosophy, I want you to take it from the man himself. This is something we're going to try to do with all these candidates here, going to do with all these candidates here, just give you a little bit of a a taste for what they're like personality-wise. Uh, at his introductory press conference back in 2021, Staley was specifically asked about his defensive philosophy. Here is what he had to say. You know, we want to we want to uniquely shape it around our guys. And I think that that's probably um, the hallmark of the way we play is that agility uh, that we have to feature, you know, our premium players. And I think that um, the flexibility we have to match up with the, the specific offenses that we're having to face all the time. And I think that that's a real hallmark of how we played. And I think, you know, it, it, it sort of expressed itself this year. And, um, and I think the way that we play on defense is the exact way we want to play on offense and in the kicking game. And I think that's what I wanted to express in the interview is that we want to put people in conflict. We want to use multiple groupings to take advantage of our players. Um, we want to play with different tempos to put, you know, people, um, you know, in a, in a real bind. And so, you know, people talk about complementary football, you know, that's how you do it is you have offense, defense, and the kicking game, right, as mirror images of one another, you know, and that is how I believe you can take it, you know, um, a really long way in this league. So two things that really stick out from there that are just kind of music to my ears is somebody who sat through Joe Barry for three years, but uh, putting players in the best position to succeed, you know, getting the most out of guys within the context of your scheme and playing complementary football. Those were things that we kept asking for during the Barry era and very rarely got. So even if Staley isn't an ideal candidate in some ways, it seems like he at least has an understanding that dovetails more with what we're looking for than <laughs> Joe Barry did. Next up is Christian Parker, who at 32 years old actually isn't the youngest of the candidates, thanks to some news that came out uh, today but certainly is very young. If you're looking for a young up-and-comer, 
this is about as young as it gets. He's had five years as an NFL coach, three years as a position coach, and that is it. He did some stuff in college, uh, bounced around from a du- bunch of different lower-level programs, Virginia Virginia State, Norfolk State, Notre Dame, Texas A&M, so a couple bigger ones there at the end, but then was with the Packers, of course, in, course in 19, or 2019 and 2020, and then with the Denver Broncos since then. Just about everybody you ask has good things to say about him. Uh, they, they love his energy, love the way that he's able to uh, communicate what, what the the coaches want to do. In fact, um, according to Robbie Davis of the Let's Talk Broncos podcast, as tweeted by Patriot supporter Tyler or Taylor Kyles, because Parker has also taken a defensive coordinator interview with the New England Patriots, uh, Parker's communication and the ability to, like, bridge the gap between two different coaching trees and schemes is a big reason he's so highly thought of in in Denver. Reading from the tweet now, quote, he's been here a while and has been a huge part in the secondary, obviously with their technique, but he's also a big part of their defensive structure. Especially this season, Sean Payton wanted to bring in Vance Joseph to run a blend of his defense and the Fangio defense, which he's never been in. So Parker was practically teaching the defense early on while also teaching Vance on the finer details of it. You can watch the defense start to take form as the season went on. Early, it just looked like a bunch of jumbled up concepts with no philosophy, and they found their identity midway through the season. One thing that was notable was for me was how the defensive backs for the past few years have played a sort of passive and safe uh, style of coverage or tackling, but when things this season were really bad, him and VJ Vance Joseph flipped a switch and started to emphasize playing the ball in the air and when they tackle as well. Uh, so I think that says a lot about how adaptable he is, end quote. If we're willing to make a bet on an up-and-coming coach, I'd rather do a lower information bet where the available information says this guy is an up-and-comer uh, to what the, the kind of bet that we made on Joe Barry because of the differences in the outcomes here. So the line on Parker is that he's young, he's, he's fairly inexperienced, but he's an up-and-comer, he's going to get there. If you hire him as your defensive coordinator, the bad outcome there is, huh, I guess everyone was wrong. Contrast that to Joe Barry, where the book on him was this guy is a longtime NFL coach whose whole career is based on nepotism, and he's never really coordinated a good defense. If things go bad there, and they did, the takeaway is, well, I guess everyone was right. We were wrong, and everyone else was right. With Parker, it's exactly the inverse. If, if it turns out that everyone else is wrong, and you just believed what everyone was saying about him, who's worked with him, who's, who's been with him in meetings and stuff like that, well then uh, that's unlucky. But if you're just hoping that some guy who's never been good and who has never really coordinated a good defense un- somehow turns it around and he turns out to not be any good at all, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. Parker, I think, at least in, in some of the stuff that I've read and heard about him, seems to come across as a really good communicator. And the way that he communicates to players is a part of his coaching philosophy, I think, in, in a really important way. Uh, back when he was the the defensive backs coach, well, I guess he still is the defensive backs coach of the the Denver Broncos. He was actually asked about that communication philosophy. Here's what he had to say. You know, sometimes as coaches, we can, you know, you there's a certain way we can talk upstairs and a certain way that you talk to the players. So you don't want to give them too much information. We have to streamline it for them. And then when guys have been coached for a while, then they can kind of put it in even more like layman's terms to their teammates because it's a different perspective because they're actually out there on the field. So we have that perspective as we talk to them. But then sometimes like the way K-Jack can talk about something to a guy might be the same message as me, but it might be another way of doing it. So however it hits their brain, whether it's, you know, in the meeting with me, a walkthrough with me, they come off the field. I tell, hey, you know, Justin, grab grab him and, you know, go over X, Y, Z. He knows what I'm talking about and we can kind of put that direct message to him. Next up on the interview list is uh, Denver, or Dallas Cowboys defensive line coach Adam Durday, or depending on the pronunciation source you go with, uh, Aiden Dirty or Aiden Durday or Adam Dirty. I think I've covered all the possible permutations there. 44 years old, has a very interesting coaching background. Just misses Matt LaFleur in Atlanta by a year, was with the Falcons as their defensive quality control coach in 2018 and 2019, then promoted to outside linebackers coach in 2020. He's been with the Cowboys since 2021. The connection there is that he coached under Dan Quinn in Atlanta, which led to his job in Dallas. Quinn is characterized usually as a cover three type guy, which is similar to some of the things that the Packers want to do, different in some of the finer details. If Dirty ends up being the guy or Dirty, uh, however you want to say it, ends up being the guy, we can um, 
parse the finer details at that at that point. But the real the real thing on Dirty Dirty is uh, that he is not from the United States. He's a, a native of London, and you'll hear that in his accent here in a second. Actually played in NFL Europe for a while, bounced around a couple NFL practice squads. My gut feeling on him is that he wouldn't be that big of a departure on where the Packers are currently. I do like that he's got a defensive line perspective. The counter here is that Quinn's defenses have not been overly successful in the NFL. And if you if you want to criticize the Fangio tree stuff, I think you have to levy a lot of the same criticism towards the cover three stuff because a lot of people saw what the what the Seattle Seahawks did you know, in the early 2000 teens, whatever you call that, 2012 and on, the Legion of Boom era, put it that way. They saw what the Seahawks did and said, we'd like to have some of that because why wouldn't you? But the the real key there is that the, the Seahawks had uh, Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor and a bunch of other really good defensive backs uh, with a couple of really good pass rushers up front. And it turns out that that's really the important thing in in the scheme there is having a bunch of Hall of Fame caliber defensive players and it turns out the Hall, of, the Hall of Fame caliber defensive players don't really travel as well as the scheme does. So you can take the scheme with you when you leave Seattle, but you can't take the Hall of Fame Hall of Famers with you. And that would be the situation that Dirty's running into in Green Bay. He doesn't even get to bring over the good guys from Dallas's defense. He just has to work with the guys that are in Green Bay, which is it's not inconsiderable. But we're not talking, you know again, Legion of Boom era Seahawks, if we want to make the Quinn comparison. I liked how he talked in the soundbite that, sound that I'm going to play about his philosophy of bouncing back from losses. So the Cowboys had a few bad losses this year, including the one that ended their season, am I right? Um, but they had some some down games this year. He talked about his philosophy from bouncing back in a couple of those. If I'm really honest with you, I think that's the growth of our unit, is that we should always have the chip on our shoulder. It shouldn't matter who we play. So, like, I think... Did it come out and obviously you want to right your wrongs? Of course you do. It's the same as when we lost to Arizona, you know? But, like, I think for the growth of us, it's like now the understanding of that, just having that mentality that when we walk on a the field, they have to deal with us. Like, if we do the things we're going to do, we go through the process, we're going to go through that week, they have to deal with us, you know, and let, let the chips fall where they fall. I love that mentality. They have to deal with us. It's an easy philosophy that can to go wrong, like if, if you aren't very good, the opposing team will just say, fine, I, I would love to deal with you. That's not going to be that big of a challenge for me. But if you are approaching your business that way as a defensive player, you got to make sure that you're dealing with me. Well, that's a pretty, pretty great place to be. Next up on our list is Denard Wilson, 45 years old, longtime NFL assistant coach. We've talked about his details now on two different podcasts, so I'm not going to go super in-depth there. The... The thing here is that he's my favorite guy so far. Um, as a coach, you can see his a very diverse background here. He's got time under Greg Williams, who was uh, the defensive coordinator for the for the New New Orleans Saints when they won the Super Bowl. Uh, he's got quarter, uh, coordinator experience or, or experience under Todd Bowles with the Jets, who you know even if he hasn't been a great head coach, he can run some defenses. He's even got experience under Jonathan Gannon with the Eagles. Um, so he's. He's got some some interesting, different perspectives to defense. I wouldn't say he's particularly married to one scheme tree at this point. Reading about him, hearing the way he communicates, hearing the way that he talks, I can't really think of a good reason why you wouldn't want to hire this guy. The closest I could get is wondering how he'd fit in in Green Bay when it looks like he probably would have to keep most or all of his defensive staff even if you you um, don't end up keeping Joe Barry, whatever that report was, or keeping some of the guys, we're getting fairly late in the game to change a whole ton here because the the game of defensive coordinator magical chairs is beginning to wind down. You see jobs being filled, people moving around. Other staffs are going to be filling out. And if they bring in a guy like Wilson or anybody – too late here, he's going to potentially miss out on the chance to hire some of the guys that he would like to work with. We've probably got the best quote of any of these guys, other than Staley, because he talks specifically about his philosophy, from Wilson. I didn't pay attention to what season it was before. He was only in Philly for two years, so it's either 2021 or 2022. But a reporter asked him during training camp if he'd ever thought about you know, wh- how you would like to do things 
if you became a defensive coordinator. Here's what he said. Look, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've been around some great defensive coordinators, in my opinion. You know, I've been groomed by Greg Williams. I've been groomed by Todd Bowles, um, who are very good in this league, and they're very thorough. Um, so, you know, I've been, tu- I've been tutored by them. I know how to, to run a ship. I know, you know the responsibility. So with, if the opportunity presents itself, I'll be more than I'll be I'll be ready for it. But I'm here where my feet are. All right. And I'm just trying to be the best defensive back coach that I could be. He's been a pretty good defensive backs coach in the NFL. So that counts for something there. Final interview prospect here is Zachary Orr or Zach Orr, depending on which media source you want to go with. 31 years old, a former NFL player, played with the Ravens from 2014 through 2016, actually was a second team all pro in 2016, got a little dinged up toward the end of the season, had some neck issues went to the team doctor, had him take a look. Turns out he has a congenital neck issue that had like a, it depends what, how you want to call it or, or exactly what you want to call it. Basically a narrowing or a constricting of one of the vertebrae in his neck. I believe it's similar uh, to what guys like Terrence Murphy and Nick Collins had. The, the, the net net of it is that if he took another hit from the wrong angle, <laughs> the report I, I read about it, and this is no laughing matter, but just the phraseology here is kind of funny. The report I read said that if he took a hit from the wrong angle, his C1 vertebrae could explode, which seems bad to me. I would prefer that not happen to me, and there's a chance that it could have either paralyzed or killed him. Not ideal. So he retires from the NFL, later gets cleared to return to football. Nobody will sign him because his neck issue, I mean, nobody wants to deal with that. Uh, so he gets into the coaching, has two stints with the, the Ravens twice, starts out with the Ravens for the 2017 as a defense, uh, 2017 season, excuse me, as a defensive analyst, uh, heads down to Jacksonville with Urban Meyer for the 2021 season. That does not go well, as we all know. Then for 2022 and 2023, he was back with the Ravens as a, a linebackers coach. The gut feeling on Parker is that he is even more raw than, or excuse me, the gut feeling on Orr is that he's even more raw than Christian Parker, has even less experience has not apparently, I, from from the context that I have, has not had even as much experience as Parker has had communicating a defense, uh, doing the things that Parker has done to help run a defense. But John Harbaugh does not seem too worried about him. From Harbaugh himself, quote, he's always got that fire. You can always count on Zach. If you ask his opinion, he's telling it to you. You appreciate that because he's got conviction. I see confidence all the time, and I now I see him growing, even growing competence. He's really has learned the game. He was a very smart player who's taken the time to study and learn the game, and he's become a good teacher. He breaks things down well and presents it to the guys very well. He's doing a really good job, end quote. So very similar to some of the stuff that we said about Parker, but maybe a year or two behind where Parker is. You can see the the beginnings of something like this in or uh, that you see with Parker, but he might be a couple of years away. It does occur to me that it is possible that the the Packers could bring in or just as some additional due diligence on Wilson, say, hey, what do you like about working with, with uh, Denard Wilson? And if he gives you a good answer, that might help you confirm your decision on Wilson one way or another. I don't really have a coaching-specific soundbite on or, but I did like what he had to say in his official you know video. He did a sit-down interview with the, with the Baltimore Ravens media staff about what it was like to walk away from football. Keep in mind that he's only 24 when he's having this conversation. So just listen to the maturity about having his football dream kind of taken from him by things entirely out of his control as his career was really just taking off. It's a little difficult. When I first uh, found out the news, I felt like I had so much more on the field that uh, I could improve on. And I was looking forward to coming back next year better than ever. But you know, after sitting talking with my family and, you know, talking to God, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. And he's done with this chapter in my life, as, as tough as it may seem, as shocking as it is, uh, you know, he's going to open up another chapter. And now I'm excited for that and ready to move forward with that. And uh, like I said, I couldn't be more thankful, but it definitely was difficult at first, but I'm at peace with everything now. So I think a lot of maturity in that answer, just finding that peace, I think even if you share his faith in, you know, God having a plan for your life, that's still a hard thing to accept. It's things that are entirely out of your control and it's, it's just over. That's it. There's no more. There's no, well, maybe it could get better because it's not, it's not going to get better. And he just kind of, 
he took it in stride. And I'm sure, you know, you're putting on your best face for the, the media friendly answer there, but still, I think a lot of maturity there. And I think it looks like he's headed in the right direction as a coach, even if now isn't his time, you could see a future where he is a coach. Uh, with maturity like that. Wanted to conclude today by talking a little bit about Matt LaFleur. We are at the point in our season review where we need to talk about Matt LaFleur. And part of his his review here uh, for 2024, I guess, already is going to be his head or his defensive coordinator hire. But overall, the impressions on, on Matt LaFleur, pretty good. Feeling pretty solid here in year five. And boy, year five already, I think you can make a case that this has been his most challenging year as a coach ever. And that is saying something. Sitting down to prep for this conversation, just look at what he has dealt with in his career. He really ever hasn't ever had a normal quote-unquote year as a head coach. 2024 arguably could be the first one ever. 2019, his first year as a head coach. Nothing is ever going to compare to that. 2020, you've got the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The world goes to hack in March of twenty, uh, March of twenty twenty, and you just got to deal with that as a head coach. Things went really well until the very end of the season, but overall, twenty twenty, pretty solid season there in your second year. Twenty twenty one, you've got the Aaron Rodgers rumors ho- hanging over your whole off season. You've got to deal with him coming in at the start of training camp, which is nuking the entire organization in that press conference. Still can't believe we got that presser. By the way, that was incredible. Uh, just to to look back on that, it'll be three years ago this summer, Aaron Rodgers just sitting up there and letting it fly for half an hour. That was unbelievable. So Lafleur's there for that. 2022, we've got Aaron Rodgers' rumors part two. He signs the extension in the offseason, but Devontae Adams departs. You've got the ongoing issues throughout 2022 with David Bakhtiari. And then in 2023, essentially a completely new offense, and things do not go well at the start for Lafleur and the Packers' offense. If we break things down into the bad and the good for LaFleur, the bad pretty much is the whole first half of the season. Call it the start of the season. Not all of it is in his control, but even accounting for the rookie learning curve, the learning curve that comes with the start of the the Jordan Love era, the, the soft landing attempt from Aaron Rodgers and all he brings to the offense. That's all in his hands and I think ultimately falls on the floor. Sure, you got to get you got to understand that rookies are going to be rookies. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have a hard time adjusting to the NFL because that's that's how it goes for everybody. It's hard for everybody, but easing that transition is part of the deal for you as a, a head coach. Getting your your first year starting quarterback up to speed that's part of your job as a a, a head coach. And uh, love for a lot of the first half of the season did not look ready to play. That's all in his plans in his hands. Excuse me. Uh, as Matt LaFleur. Then you've got the Joe Barry issue. Um, You know, Joe Barry is gone now, but as far as 2023 goes, I think we have to continue to ding LaFleur for the Joe Barry hire. It did affect the Packers in 2023. Part of the reason things got tense down the stretch was because of the collapse against teams like the Giants. And, you know, that's not all Barry's fault, but they they did give up the game-winning drive. They let Baker Mayfield throw all over them the very next week. Then you've got the end of the the 49ers game. A better performance from Barry's defenses could have changed the complexion of the Packers season. It was a real problem, and it was it was Matt Lafleur's decision. And then you look at those Giants and Buccaneers games in particular. Those do get put on the head coach, fair or not. A lot of it was Joe Barry's fault, and it should be said, it should be pointed out that Lafleur came out after a lot of those games and said he was happy with where the defense was. He was he was satisfied with the defensive performance. It's not the the Giants or Buccaneers losses, but after the Panthers game, a, a game in which the offense put up 33 points, LeFleur came out and said, we need more from the offense. It was all on the offense from that point forward. The point is, in those games, you saw nearly everything the team had rallied for in that back half of the season nearly thrown away because of decisions that were in large part tied to LeFleur. Joe Barry is his guy. Joe Barry was the problem. They couldn't score enough to put away Tommy DeVito. That is a problem. They laid a significant egg in the in a primetime game when they absolutely had to have it. And one of the first times that season when you really sat down and said, yes, this is a game the Packers absolutely should win, and they just came out and fell apart. That That's pretty bad. However, there is a lot to like about LaFleur's effort this season, too. If you want to characterize this team in one word, I would I would say resilient. 
I think there are a few times you can point to the Packers this year being a really strong, resilient team, both in the micro and the macro stuff. You can look at some individual games and really see them sticking with it to the very end. The Saints game comes to mind. They could have easily knuckled under in that game and just said, all right, this is it. We're, we're down 17 or 18 or whatever it was. We're just going to call it, and that's going to be it. We're a young team. Nobody expects this of us. We're just, yeah, we'll get them next week or maybe next year. But they didn't. They hung in there, and they came back and, and won 18 points uh, down the stretch, and the Packers come away with a come-from-behind win. In the macro level, the, the Packers pulled out of a tailspin. Two and five to the playoffs is quite a turnaround. That is that is in large part a credit to the head coach. Sure, the players start playing better, but the fact that they they hung in there and were able to pull that pull out of that dive and get to the postseason is is incredible. Then you got some big wins in some big moments this year. I think this is a, a real strength of the Packers this year. They came up in some really big moments. As much as the, the 49ers lost things, they were they were right there at the end. And as much as losing to the Giants on Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football, whichever it was, uh, stings, okay, sure. But then they beat the Bears in week one and beat them badly after we heard all offseason how the Bears had turned it around. The Bears were, were the team to beat now. The Bears, the Bears, the Bears. Turns out, no. And then the Packers just handled the Bears. You got the Packers taking apart the Lions on Thanksgiving. They they beat the Chiefs on Sunday Night Football. They beat the Vikings on New Year's Eve, and then they destroy the Cowboys. I don't know. Have you heard about that? They destroyed the Cowboys in the wild card round of the playoffs. I feel like a lot of people have missed that, so we're just going to keep mentioning it. Make sure that you remember that the Packers just obliterated the Cowboys in the playoffs. Uh, just don't want that to go go by the boards here. And then I think you have to give Lafleur a lot of credit for. Jordan Love's development. We'll talk more about Love and the specific things that he did to grow and change over the course of the year um, when we talk about the quarterbacks, which will be sometime next week, I believe. But I think you can talk a lot about how LaFleur helped him over the course of this season. He really did change his game a lot over the course of the year. And I think if you want to pin it down on just a couple of things he did, you can credit it credit it to one thing he did do and one thing he he didn't do. LaFleur, that is. One thing I think LaFleur did do is he got Love to stop running. Go to Pro Football Reference, look at Love's game-by-game rushing attempt stat. They crater over the course of the year. And I think that's a perfect representation of a guy settling down in the pocket. Love just stopped trying to make plays for himself and let the offense work around him, and it did. And then... LaFleur also didn't stop Love from throwing deep. This was a big talking point on this podcast and basically throughout the Packers media world over the first half to three quarters of the season even. The Packers just could not throw deep. And a lot of that was because Love seemed to have lost his deep ball or the deep ball we thought he had may have been a mirage, but it just, it wasn't there. The Packers could not throw deep to save their life. But what does Matt LaFleur do? He sits there and says, we're just going to keep doing it. We got to keep going deep. And we're going to keep doing it until it works. And you know what they did? They kept doing it. And eventually, things got better. A lot better. And they stuck with it. Here's how you know they stuck with it. Going by average depth of target, six of Love's nine games with the largest average depth of target came in week eight or later. They did go deep more. In fact, they went more or went deep the most at the very end of the season. Four of Love's six games with an average depth of target of 10 yards or more downfield, came in week 10 or later. They're going bombs away late in the season because it finally started working, and they just never gave up on the the approach. Lafleur always believed in going deep, and the numbers reflect that they kept doing it, and it kept working or started to work in ways that it hadn't worked at all early in the season. Is that Lafleur? Is that love? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, Lafleur believing in his guy, love finally delivering, as they kept doing it, but he gave Love the chance to continue to do that. Bottom line, I think, for LaFleur is that there's no reason not to believe in him. I'm confident in the job he's doing. He helped save the season, and he helped save his job. I think that, you know, tear it down talk that we and seemingly everybody else was having in the middle of the season was not unrealistic. If they're sitting there at 2-5 and and finish at, what, 4-13, and there's really... Not a good reason, I think, to keep 
Lafleur on. If you bottom out that badly in a division overall as weak as the NFC North was, in a conference as overall weak as the NFC was, even you know accounting for it being the first year for a lot of these guys and Jordan Love's first year as the starter, that is that's not <laughs> that's not a savable situation. But Love turn or but Lafleur turns it around. Love turns it around, and looking ahead to 2024, he made this a desirable destination for a defensive coordinator. I think that means a lot. So say the Packers did bottom out in 2023, uh, but not to the extent that Lafleur gets fired. You're going into 2024 thinking that he might be on the hot seat. Is that a situation you want to jump to as a defensive coordinator? Really taking a risk with a guy who might not be there a year from now, and then you've got to go back in the job market and try to find a place to place to fit in again? I don't think so. But Lafleur saved the season, saved his own job, and set himself up for future success. And I think if we're talking about players getting put in position to succeed, you've got to talk about the coach putting himself in position to succeed too because that's what Lafleur did, and that is what he continued to do. It's an exciting time to be a Packers fan. That's how we concluded the Brian Gutekunst episode. I think that's what we got to conclude uh, the Lafleur episode saying as well. And we'll do it with the defensive coordinator one too, because you know, talking about the Barry recap. Well, there's very little to recap that's that's going to matter. We're just going to say Barry wasn't very good in 2023, and then we're going to talk more about the guy to come. Uh, So that'll be an exciting time. We'll talk about that being an exciting time to be a Packers fan. It'll be the case with the love. It's going to be the case for a lot of positions on this Packers roster. Because things really looking ahead coming out of 2023 look pretty bright. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I'd appreciate it even more if you take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.